Lakehurst, New Jersey, 725 in the evening, May 6th, 1937. Delayed by storms, the airship Hindenburg was finally preparing to land. Passengers peered down looking for familiar faces as the ship turned for the final descent. Water ballast was released to bring her into trim. Engines were reversed from idle ahead to idle astern. Winchmen paid out handling lines to the ground crew. Tragedy is seconds away. The mystery is, was it an accident or sabotage? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Lakehurst, New Jersey is a place that time has passed by. Forty years ago, it was the city of the future. The nearby Naval Air Station was the East Coast Terminal for dirigible transatlantic crossings. The mammoth hangar strained to accommodate these giants of the air. Airship travel had become a reality. Germany was the starting point for most of these lighter-than-air voyages due to the engineering dominance of the company founded by Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin. In 1924, the company built this dirigible for the United States as part of Germany's reparations for World War I. Named the Los Angeles, she was piloted to Lakehurst by Hugo Eckener, the foremost authority on commercial airships and head of the Zeppelin Company. In 1928, Hugo Eckener built the largest, most luxurious airship to date the Graf Zeppelin. Wherever she flew, the Graf Zeppelin was hailed as proof of the practicality of airship travel. Her popularity helped to restore the war-ravaged pride of the German people, many of whom had contributed money for her construction. In 1929, the Graf circumnavigated the world carrying passengers. Airlines with fixed-wing planes would not equal this feat for years. She established a regular schedule of flights from Germany to Brazil, years before transatlantic airplane service. Ocean liners were the only competition in the Atlantic. Hugo Eckener felt confident his dirigibles could cut the transatlantic crossing time to two days, but he would need a new airship, one larger and faster than the Graf Zeppelin. By late 1934, a new dirigible was under construction. She would be the largest airship ever built, the largest object ever put into the sky. She would be called the Hindenburg. 147 feet high and one-sixth of a mile long, she was so massive that a special hangar had to be constructed to house her. The control car would be separated from the passenger accommodations, which would be contained in the underside of the hull. Seventy air travelers could be pampered by a 40-man crew as never before. The metal framework would surround 16 huge gas bags. Seven million cubic feet of lighter-than-air gas would give the Hindenburg buoyancy. 
Unlike other German Zeppelins, which were filled with explosive hydrogen, Hugo Eckener had designed the Hindenburg to be filled with helium, a gas so safe it would actually smother fire. The United States was the primary source of this rare natural gas and was at first willing to sell it to the Zeppelin company. Adolf Hitler's rise to power complicated the negotiations. Hitler saw the airships as propaganda machines to carry the message of the Third Reich around the world. The increasing militancy of the Nazi government caused the United States to have second thoughts about selling its helium to a German company, fearing it would be used in dirigibles fitted for war. A disappointed Eckener had no choice. If he wanted the Hindenburg to fly, she had to be inflated with flammable hydrogen. In early March 1936, the Hindenburg was ready. Accompanied by the Graf Zeppelin, the Hindenburg set out on a three-day propaganda flight. Eckener complained loudly and publicly about what he considered to be the misuse of his airships. The furious propaganda minister forbade the German press to ever mention Eckener's name again. Earlier, Eckener's anti-Nazi sentiments had brought him into disfavor with the Third Reich. He was removed as director of the Zeppelin Company. The airships sailed on. Named for the former German president, the Hindenburg was the symbol of the new Nazi era. The 1936 Olympics were to be a showcase for the master race. In the wake of Jesse Owens' four gold medals, the stunned Nazis turned to the Hindenburg to regain their lost prestige. In 1936, the Hindenburg made 10 flights from Germany to the United States. Almost every crossing set a new transatlantic speed record. In her first year, the Hindenburg logged almost 200,000 miles, carrying over 2,600 passengers. Docking at Lakehurst, the Hindenburg was reunited with her smaller sister ship, the Los Angeles. Eckener's joy in the Hindenburg's success was dampened by the fact that she was now piloted by Captain Ernst Lehmann, the new head of the nationalized Zeppelin Company. In spite of increasing international tensions, the Zeppelin Company established an ambitious passenger schedule for 1937. 18 flights from Germany to Lakehurst were planned for the Hindenburg. Almost immediately after the announcement of the schedule, the German embassy in Washington began receiving threats against the airship. Warnings came by phone and mail that the Hindenburg would be destroyed at Lakehurst. When the Hindenburg was ready to leave on her first U.S. flight of 1937, the ship was thoroughly searched for any kind of destructive device. Passengers' luggage was also carefully inspected. Although this flight would be commanded by Captain Max Pruce, Captain Lehman decided to go along, hoping his presence would help alleviate the rumors of sabotage. The Hindenburg was ready. Captain Proust gave the launch command, up ship. The Hindenburg lifted off from Frankfurt in the evening of May 3, 1937. The 97 people on board expected the flight to be as routine as several years of passenger service had proven it could be. The 
route across Europe was determined by international politics. The Hindenburg flew across Holland to the English Channel. By May 4th, the Hindenburg was over the North Atlantic. Violent storms and strong headwinds reduced her speed to only 60 miles per hour. Unaffected by the turbulence outside, passengers settled down to a meal of Rhine salmon a la Hindenburg. The great airship flew on smoothly through the storms and lightning that would delay her arrival. In the afternoon of May 5th, the cloud cover broke long enough for passengers to catch a glimpse of North America, the southern tip of Newfoundland. Throughout the night, the Hindenburg sailed down the Canadian coast, headed for the United States. The morning of May 6th found the Hindenburg over a foggy Boston, 10 hours behind schedule. As she flew further south, the clouds cleared. The Hindenburg came to New York City in bright sunshine. As the Hindenburg left New York, Lakehurst radioed that a weather front was moving into the New Jersey area. The Hindenburg reached Lakehurst at four in the afternoon, but gusty winds and rain made an immediate landing impossible. She turned east, back out to sea, to ride out the storm over the New Jersey coast. She would have to wait three more hours before reaching her final resting place. Five p.m., May 6th, 1937. The airship Hindenburg cruised off the New Jersey coast, waiting for the weather to clear at Lakehurst. At 6.23 p.m., Lakehurst radioed, recommend landing now. Captain Pruce acknowledged and set course for Lakehurst. Radio commentator Herb Morrison recorded her arrival for the first transcontinental broadcast. Well, here it comes, ladies and gentlemen, and what a great sight it is. A thrilling one. The ship is riding majestically toward us like some great feather. It's a marvelous... Newsreel cameras word as water ballast was released to bring the ship into trim. The ship is no doubt busting with activity, as we can see. Orders are shouted to the crew. The passengers are probably lining the windows, looking down the field ahead of them, getting their glimpse of the mooring mast. It's practically standing still now. They've dropped ropes out of the nose of the ship. It's been taken a hold of down on the field by a number of men. It's starting to rain again. It's, the rain had uh, flagged up a little bit. The back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it. It's right under the plane. Get it started. Get it started. It's right. It's right. It's right. It's terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's running, rushing into flames. And and it's falling on the morning fast, and all the folks are screaming that this is terrible. This is one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's running four or five hundred feet into the sky, and it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the flame is rising to the ground, not quite to the morning fast. All the humanity, and all the fans are just screaming around I don't, I can't even talk to people. The friends are on there. It's a, it's a, oh. I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. Honest, it's just laid down past the smoking wreckage. <laughs> and everybody can hardly breathe and talk and screaming. Lady, I, I, I'm sorry. Honestly, I, I can hardly breathe. I, I'm going to step inside where I cannot see it. <laughs> Johnny, that's terrible. <laughs> I can't. I, let's, folks, I, I'm going to have to stop for a minute because they, I've lost the voice. This is the worst thing I've ever witnessed. Even today, the disaster is vivid in the memories of those who witnessed the crash. A member of the ground crew was directly beneath the Hindenburg when she exploded. Lawrence Thomas. My job was to have what they call a spider line. I would hook the spider line onto the ship, and there would be eight men would spread out with the different ropes and pull just as hard as they could. 
So just as I was reaching for the, the rope to put my spider line on, she went boom, and it blew it right out of my hand. As a matter of fact, if I remember correctly, I think most of us went off our feet. Stanley True worked at the Lakehurst base as an ambulance driver. They asked us to take the two uh, commanding officers, which was Captain Proust and Captain Lehman, and we proceeded to put them in our ambulances. Captain Proust, who was I was uh, attending in the ambulance, was burnt from head to foot, but he was in perfect spirits. Captain Lehman seemed to me like he was gone. Miraculously, 62 people on board the Hindenburg escaped from the flames. The death toll was 36. 13 passengers, 22 crew members, and one groundsman. Captain Proust did recover, but Captain Lehman died from his burns. The Hindenburg herself was the last of her kind. The 13 passengers killed in the Hindenburg crash were the only passenger fatalities in the Zeppelin Company's 30-year history. The reason for the fire that consumed the great airship was obvious. The 7 million cubic feet of volatile hydrogen gas contained in the hull. The reason why the fire started has been a source of controversy to this day. Was it accident or sabotage? One man has spent a lifetime sifting the evidence. World authority on airships and author of numerous books on the subject, Dr. Douglas Robinson. I've never been satisfied that the ship was sabotaged. I don't think there's been adequate proof of a plot to do so. I believe uh, that there was an accidental ignition of leaking hydrogen. Uh, there is no doubt at all that the ship landed in a condition where there is a very high electrical potential difference right after a thunderstorm. After she dropped her landing rope, she was discharging the electricity, static electricity, into the atmosphere. The other question, of course, is there is obviously free hydrogen that was ignited by the brush discharge. Uh, how was there free hydrogen present? And there's quite a number of arguments about that, and there's certainly no agreement. How could hydrogen have escaped from the gas-tight bags? How could it have ignited? Theories were debated immediately after the disaster at a board of inquiry convened by the U.S. Department of Commerce. Germany sent an official commission headed by Hugo Eckener. Airship officials from both countries looked to Eckener to provide the answers. Eckener speculated that a bracing wire inside the hull had broken during landing maneuvers in the gusty winds. The broken wire slashed open a gas cell, allowing hydrogen to escape. It was then ignited by static electricity, sometimes called St. Elmo's fire. Eckener's theory was accepted as the official conclusion by both American and German investigators. Everybody involved in the accident investigation assumed that there had been St. Elmo's fire, but nobody had actually seen it among the witnesses who appeared. I think this was because they were all standing underneath the ship and couldn't see what was going on on top. But quite a few years ago, I interviewed a couple who were standing outside the main gate of the air station and had quite a different view of the disaster. They were about a quarter mile away. They saw it silhouetted against the evening sky, and both of them observed a dim blue flame flickering along the full length of the top of the ship and even had time to exchange some remarks about it before there was a sudden a yellow flaming burst of burning hydrogen from just ahead of the upper fin. So I see a feel of no doubt whatever there was St. Elmo's fire, and it did set fire to escaping hydrogen. Many present at the Board of Inquiry, however, disagreed. They argued that the ship had been subjected to much greater stress without wires breaking, and that St. Elmo's fire was not powerful enough to ignite hydrogen gas. They believed the Hindenburg had been destroyed by another cause, sabotage. I spent a morning with Captain Cruz, the captain of the Hindenburg at the time of the fire in 1957. He by then had convinced himself that the ship was sabotaged and uh, insisted that a particular passenger had used various excuses to be in the tail of the ship to plant a bomb. The sabotage threats received by the German embassy before the Hindenburg took off were brought up in the testimony at the inquiry in 1937, but they were not pursued. 
because official investigations were clouded by diplomatic considerations, it may never be known whether the Hindenburg was destroyed by accident or by sabotage. Either way, it is likely that there would have been no fire if the ship had been filled with helium instead of hydrogen. Had it not been for the strained international politics of the 1930s, the tragedy of the great airship Hindenburg might never have occurred. The Hindenburg crash sounded the death knell for giant passenger airships. Today, however, there is no longer the risk of fire that threatened the hydrogen-filled dirigibles. Helium is easily available. Perhaps commercial lighter-than-air service has a future after all. Goodyear public relations spokesman Ron Bell. With uh, the fuel efficiency of the airship and the energy considerations of today and our modern technology and 50 years of experience in airship manufacturing, we're going to be able to build a far superior airship to what they had in the days of the Hindenburg. We have two airships currently uh, that we have designed. One of them is the heavy lifter, 450 feet long and capable of carrying 75 tons of cargo. The other airship is the Coastal Patrol airship, and it's 320 feet long and able to patrol uh, international as well as domestic borders. Uh, they have a very real feasibility. They're far more economical than aircraft and uh, faster than ships for cargo transportation. In Europe and America, a number of companies are designing and testing a new generation of lighter-than-air craft. Perhaps the airship business is about to take up where the Hindenburg left off. <laughs>